You know, for months now, viewers have been asking us if more people have become homeless in Portland since the pandemic started. And unfortunately, while we see what you all see on the streets, we can't say for sure because the last official count of Multnomah County's homeless population happened in 2019. It showed more than 2000 people were living on our streets at that time. All the counts scheduled since have been postponed because of COVID. But tonight, we do have a different and grim indicator that tragically, yes, our crisis is worse than ever. According to the latest domicile unknown report from Multnomah County out today, the number of people dying on the streets has hit a record high. The report says 126 people died while experiencing homelessness in 2020. That's up from 113 people in 2019 and 92 in 2018. Go all the way back to 2013. That same report showed 32 people died on our streets. And another stat highlighted in that report, the average age of those dying is young, 46 years old. Now, it's one thing to show you the numbers, and I think those were mistaken stats there, but I know you heard them. It's another thing to show you uh, more than the numbers. And frankly, at a news conference today, officials wanted to make sure they drove home the point that we're talking about people with lives and with stories, and frankly, with families. Families like that of Hope Yamasaki. Her son, Chris, is counted among the dead. Here's his story. My son, Christopher Jordan Madsen Yamasaki, he was born in 1993. He was a beautiful baby. He was curious and excited about life. He loved bowling. He and his brother bowled tournaments and won trophies. He even bowled a 300, which is a perfect score. He went to the Metropolitan Learning Center with his two siblings in Northwest Portland. After high school, he went on to Job Corps and got certificates in welding and plumbing. And then he was then offered a position in AmeriCorps working in wind technology and flown to Colorado. He was very excited about that. That's also when he had his first major mental health breakdown. He was later diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. So Yamasaki described how Chris's struggles with mental health and staying on his medication got worse in college. Eventually, he started self-medicating with drugs including meth. What happened next, she said, shocked her and her entire family. Chris, with the help of his family, she says, tried to get into treatment several times. He rotated between trying to get help for addiction and trying to get treatment for mental health. He would be asked to leave addiction centers because they can't treat mental health. Then he would be asked to leave the mental health hospital because they can't treat addiction issues. He didn't want to leave. Sometimes he would beg to stay. He did want help. The last time he was kicked out of the mental health center, it was in the middle of the night. He was dropped off at a shelter 12 hours before he was scheduled to be transported to a dual diagnosis center that might be able to help him. His state was so bad, he didn't even remember how to call me, and he lost his spot at the center and had to go back on the waiting list. So that cycle, Yamazaki said, continued until one morning in February 2020. A police officer knocked on the family's door. Chris had been found dead in a tent in Northwest Portland, not far from where he went to grade school. The family is devastated, as you'd expect, and they're also still to this day flabbergasted because until her son needed it, uh, Hope told us she had no idea it was so hard to get treatment for addiction and for mental health at the same time. And what's more, the drug that gripped her son, meth, is more addictive than ever. We've covered this here on this show, how there's kind of a new, cheaper, more addictive meth floating around on the streets. It's called P2P meth, and it's basically made from household ingredients that are easier to get. And experts say it causes immediate extreme psychosis. You might remember we talked to three men in recovery from meth who now work to clean up Portland streets, and they believe that new meth is absolutely fueling Portland's housing crisis. And earlier today, here are those numbers from before, officials say meth was a significant factor, contributing to 62, or nearly half, of the 126 deaths of people experiencing homelessness overall. And it was a significant factor in 80% of overdose deaths. Experts with Multnomah County said 
there is reason to believe that more help is on the way. And specifically, they said thanks to Measure 110, which you might remember, it was approved by Oregon voters last year. And among other things, it's using marijuana tax revenue and other funds to open more addiction treatment facilities. Well, Yamasaki wishes there had been any resources or facilities available for her son when he needed them, particularly aimed at, again, treating addiction and mental health resources at the same time. I feel so much guilt and sadness, but we desperately need dual diagnosis centers and walk-in detox, safe places for people to be um, who are on meth, and we need better options. Help is not as easy to get as many people think. There's just not enough resources available. The houseless matter. Those with mental health issues and addiction difficulties matter. Chris mattered. And he's loved and he's missed. And my heart breaks every day for him and everyone in those circumstances. Our thanks to Hope Yamasaki and her family for sharing Chris's story. And we're just so sorry.